Uh, let's get going here. Before we introduce our speaker, I want to remind you to please complete the surveys, which are incredibly helpful to CFRI in planning the next event. And remember, you can earn points for doing so. Let's also take a moment to once again thank our sponsors. Their generous underwriting made this conference possible, and it was due to their support that we could offer this event at no cost to attendees. We especially recognize our major sponsors, Vertex Pharmaceuticals and Genentech, Gilead Sciences, uh, Chise USA, AbbVie, and Ionis Pharmaceuticals. We are grateful to all of these supportive companies. And now our first speakers of the morning. They are Dr. Angela Garinis and Dr. Ahmet Euler. Dr. Garinis is an assistant professor at the Oregon Hearing Research Center at Oregon Health and Science University and a principal investigator at the National Center for Rehabilitation, Rehabilitative Auditory Research at the VA Portland Healthcare System. Dr. Garinis's research is focused on the ototoxicity monitoring and management of persons receiving treatments such as aminoglycosides and her current NIH NIDCD funding support investigating the effects of ototoxic aminoglycoside treatments in patients with CF and her CF Foundation Clinical Award is a multi-center project to investigate the genetic susceptibility or resistance to ototoxicity in patients with CF. That's tough. That's a tough word. Dr. Yeah. Amet Euler is a medicine and pediatric trained pulmonologist and director of the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program at the combined Boston Children's Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital Adult Cystic Fibrosis Center. He oversees a highly effective team of research coordinators and, next page, assistants to conduct <laughs> corporate sponsored and investigator initiated clinical trials along with phase two trials as national PI. His clinical and research interests involve all aspects of cystic fibrosis care, including quality improvement initiatives, translational care, and outcome research. He has been interested in complications related to acute and chronic pulmonary therapies in an aging CF population, including kidney disease and hearing loss. Together, they will present Hearing is Believing, Hearing Health in Persons with Cystic Fibrosis. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you, Siri. And thank you to the conference organizers for inviting us to talk about something that's near and dear to our hearts. My name is Ahmed Euler. And I'm Angela Garinis. I also want to thank the CFRI community, Siri and Jim, for uh, inviting us to speak today. So our outline is, uh, as you can see here, we're going to first talk very briefly in an in introduction, talk about the airway microbiome, to the pathogenesis, and, and Angie is the expert here, not I, the pathogenesis of hearing loss and battery of uh, the tests that are available to us. Um, our current autotoxicity monitoring, so I have a tough time with that as well, and management and future treatments, and, um, and then we'll take your questions. And these are our disclosures. Um, so we've had a number of amazing talks this weekend. What a great um, lineup of speakers and just a, um, such amazing job CFRI does. Um, and that uh, we reviewed the pathogenesis of CF, but we we do understand just briefly that it is clearly a multi drug you know multi organ disease which doesn't only cause lung disease and although it is a major cause of morbidity and mortality it also leads to sinus disease that we can see here abnormal levels of sweat chloride which is how CF is diagnosed pancreas involvement leading to pancreatic insufficiency requiring enzyme replacement and also leads to CF related diabetes with increasing frequency as people with CF age. Uh, GI disease, in addition to the pancreatic insufficiency in the form of either meconium ileus in a newborn or DIOS or distal intestinal obstruction syndrome in adults, um, its impact on reproductive health, including atresia of the vas deferens and infertility in men, um, but it doesn't end there. Um, it also causes liver disease in general, leading to overt liver failure in 5 to 10% of uh, those earlier in life and requiring tr liver transplant in some sludge and stones related to gallbladder, uh, bone disease and osteoporosis, uh, both directly due to CFTR expression in bone and its potential impact on bone microarchitecture and indirectly due to the chronic inflammation medications like steroids. Um, we note pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure, enlarged spleen and some presenting with uh, splenic infarcts, 
Um, there's an, an, an increase, oh, there's a, you know, salivary gland involvement in salivary stones. Um, there's an increased association with Arnold Calorie uh, malformation, um, as well as uh, we recognize depression, anxiety, um, which is uh, such a critical um, uh, thing for us to recognize and treat, but also um, directly and indirectly due to adverse effects from our medications resulting in kidney disease or renal insufficiency, um, as well as odor toxicity and the reason why we're here today. And one of the most significant culprits are antibiotics and the reason why it is important that we know the bacteria that we're treating and to use the right treatment at the right dose. Um, here are some graphics from the registry in 2019 showing the general prevalence of bacteria by year in the top left and by age cohort in the bottom left. And then also um, on the bottom right, uh, another way of showing how these organisms uh, coexist with each other in the airway of those with CF. Um, it is also important to note that we are seeing a decreased prevalence in pseudomonas, as you can tell by the graphic on the left. Um, and uh, while other organisms also like MSSA and MRSA are also decreasing in prevalence, Stenotrophomonas and Acromobacter have plateaued. Um, and the airway microbiome is, um, as many of you know, influenced by the stress of exacerbations and the use of antibiotics. Um, and so the more antibiotics you use, the more resistant bacteria get. And the increasing availability, though, of these highly effective CF modulators that we heard so much about, and a significant drop in number of exacerbations of uh, people needing antibiotics, and a drop, you know, including a drop in people coming to the hospital for exacerbations, which is of course confounded by the pandemic, is the likely, you know, reason for this observation. I mean, just two years ago, I would regularly round on 10 to 15 people admitted to the hospital and more at home on home IVs. And this past year, it was at time zero and on average one to two patients with very few people on home IVs. However, we're still using antibiotics and they're still necessary as we deal with pseudomonas and other gram-negative organisms and multi-drug resistant organisms that require aggressive use of ototoxic, ototoxic antibiotics. And we're still dealing with the aftermath of aggressive and you know, often appropriate use of aggressive antibiotics in the recent past to preserve lung function and life from years prior to the use of modulators. Um, here is a list of antibiotics that we use to treat airway infections in CF, and it's really only a limited list, just an example, but um, we are here focusing on immunoglycosides while also touching a little bit on glycopeptides, which is another term for vancomycin, uh, that may also play a role in hearing loss. And um, hearing experts, uh, when we were doing some of our research, you know, told us that, you know, we don't know other antibiotics that might also have an impact. Um, and thus there are, you know, that it is important that we continue to track and monitor. Um, you know, we generally um, define ototoxicity as causing damage to the inner ear structures, including the auditory and vestibular portions. But for today's talk, we will focus mainly on auditory damage with aminoglycosides playing the most prominent role, including tobromycin, amicacin, and much less often uh, gentamicin. Um, we know that aminoglycosides can cause nephrotoxicity or kidney injury but it can also lead to an elevation of liver function tests as well as electrolyte disturbances like hyponatremia and hypokalemia. But this is something that we know about and we have a number of protocols to monitor regularly. Identify these abnormalities as soon as possible and make the necessary adjustments while avoiding any drug-drug interactions that can amplify toxicity and that's important for us to know. However, there are other complications that can occur that can't be monitored or anticipated with blood work and that includes neurotoxicity, and dermatologic reactions, which have to be you know, clinically apparent to be acted on. Um, and uh, also, um, while ototoxicity is not always evident, um, you know, uh, and hearing loss is not regularly monitored during hospitalization um, and not routinely monitored outpatient either prior to or um, with the use of ototoxic agents, um, we really need to uh, you know, make sure that we're monitoring this. Um, and so that's a really important aspect. And, and implications of toxicity are enormous and can lead to permanent hearing loss, as Angie will review, um, can lead to tinnitus or ringing in your ear, noises in your head and, and your ear, as well as balance issues related to vestibular function, which won't, we, we won't have time to go into, as I mentioned, but can also cause permanent and uh, lifelong trauma. So it is important to avoid from happening in the first place as much as possible. And thus here, just a quick definition about ototoxicity defined as the pharmacologic adverse of, uh, of affecting the auditory and or vestibular end organs of the inner ear, resulting in functional impairment and cellular degeneration, 
And that's exactly what we want to avoid. And I forgot to move that slide along. So sorry about that, but those are the things I was talking about. Um, and so just the next, and before I hand things over to Angie, I want to share some words reflected from people with CF who were impacted by hearing loss since one may not result, you know, recognize how impactful it can be despite the obvious importance of preserving um, lung function. Um, we know that preserving hearing function can be just as, uh, just as critical. And the first quote is from a 21 year old uh, at the time who had CF and a history of mycobacterium abscesses requiring prolonged periods of systemic and inhaled antibiotics. He moved to Boston to go to school where he was being evaluated for cochlear implants. And he said, I wish I knew this medication was gonna hurt my hearing before I started it. And this is because one of his greatest joys was going to school, the actual act of attending school and learning and interacting. Uh, this is what made him happy and gave him the greatest joy and something he couldn't easily do anymore with a degree of hearing loss. And my other patient is a 33 year old, now status post lung transplant who reported, my lungs feel great and I'm experiencing the best lung function I've ever had in a decade, but I feel alone and isolated. And it was often that we would find him reflecting on playing golf um, all alone. And that really led to um, a progression of different depression, anxiety, um, and that you know, he wasn't really able to enjoy um, that great lung function. So you can see the profound impact hearing loss can have in our community and the importance of uh, screening prevention and continuing to improve technology. And so I would like to turn things over to my friend and colleague, Angie, um, to go further into this. Thanks, Amit, and it's always a pleasure presenting with you. I wanted to quickly discuss uh, typical risk factors for hearing loss that you'll see in the general population. And this is outside of uh, the ototoxic treatments that, that Amit is uh, talking about. So as we all know, our sensory systems tend to decline over time and aging is one of the most common reasons for uh, hearing decline. Uh, Age-related hearing loss is called presbycusis, and we typically will see a higher frequency hearing loss before it progresses to lower frequencies. So this is in the situation where individuals will say, I'm having difficulties hearing a noise, or they're missing the ends of sounds like S's or Z's, um, and it's, it's, it's common, and especially over the age of 50, well, most of us will tend to experience this. Another very common, uh, and again, we probably all have some degree of damage, especially if you go to music concerts regularly, uh, cause of hearing loss is noise exposure. And I just wanna stress here, there's two different types of noise exposure that can really affect your hearing. The one that's most concerning and most impactful is uh, impact noise, which can occur from gunshots or extremely loud uh, impulse related sounds. And so these can cause extensive damage to where you can lose your hearing immediately. The other type of noise exposure can be prolonged. Like if you work in construction or if you're constantly around uh, loud sounds over time, you can eventually have degrading of the hearing system. And that can occur at the sensory hair cell in the inner part of the ear up to the nerve. The next most common and then, uh, oh, and also the stress on, there is a website I'd love to share with the group. And if you have time, just remember Dangerous Decibels and you can Google it, the site's below. Um, this is a wonderful workshop that was developed uh, by a team over at OHSU. And it gives you information about what's too loud. So to the left here, you see the thermometer and it talks about sound in uh, sound pressure level and DB sound pressure level. So the lowest on the thermometer in green is the softest sound you can hear. And when your dB sound pressure level increases all the way up to the red portion, that's because sound is so loud, it's a rocket launch and it'll take out your hearing at that point. So the safe dBSPL or sound volume that you would typically want is around busy traffic. Your auditory system can tolerate this for a longer period of time. To the right, you're seeing um, what we call continuous dB. If you're listening to a uh, loud sound for a certain period of time, that matters. The length of time really matters. So for example, at the top, you'll see continuous dB at 85. If you're listening to that level of sound for eight hours or longer, you may have some degree of um, uh, exposure that could cause hearing damage. And this is typical for individuals that are in a loud work environment, again, like construction without hearing protection. Now, the louder the sound or the increased volume, uh, the lower the time allowed before you can cause auditory damage. 
So I would highly suggest looking up the Dangerous Decibels website and get yourself familiar with what's considered too loud and then um, making sure that you protect your hearing because noise exposure uh, is also very critical. And unfortunately today we do live in a noisy world. So. The next most common risk factor that uh, you can inherit is uh, genetics, uh, hearing loss that could come from your parents. So your mother or your father, these can be recessive or dominant genes that can cause hearing loss at birth. And um, some of these genes are well known like Connexin 26 and others uh, are very rare mutations. So this also stresses the importance of monitoring hearing, especially in the NICU um, where infants are at risk for other health related issues. Um, and also at birth. And uh, this is why we have universal newborn hearing screening programs so that we can try to detect this uh, at, at a very young age in infancy, essentially. The next common risk factor for hearing loss is illness. And um, sometimes uh, people don't think about diseases like meningitis, for example, they can cause uh, what we call ossification of the cochlea. So it actually uh, creates damage to the inner part of the ear, which is fluid filled and can destroy those sensory hair cells responsible for hearing. And so you will have some cases of bacterial meningitis in children, um, which I have seen in the hospital quite frequently uh, when I was working regularly in pediatrics, where after just a two day um, about of illness, they already lost their hearing. And so with meningitis, just like other disease processes of the ear, you'll lose your high pitch hearing first, the lower frequency, and in some cases, these type, uh, types of illnesses may take out most of your hearing. And so these individuals would need some type of um, therapeutic treatment. And finally, another risk factor for hearing loss, which uh, we've already talked about is medications. And commonly in the cystic fibrosis community, we use immunoglycosides to help combat uh, bacterial infections, specifically pseudomonas. And um, one point I wanted to make here is that some individuals will develop hearing loss and others won't. We just don't know how to identify the ones that are at risk. So monitoring for everyone is important, especially those that are receiving these uh, treatments intravenously and uh, routinely. One other point is that if you take these other risk factors and you combine them, you may have an, uh, an even added or synergistic risk for hearing loss. So if someone is exposed to noise and the receiving ototoxic drugs, they may be at an even higher risk of losing their hearing. So it's important to protect your ears and to understand all the potential risk factors. Um, briefly, there, there is quite a bit of animal evidence, particularly from individuals like Peter Steiger, uh, who have shown what the mechanism related to uh, drug-induced hearing loss, specifically with drugs like immunoglycosides and cisplatin. So to the left here, what you're looking at um, are these little shell-like structures. Those are the cochlea, the inner ear. And they, send, they have sensory cells that pick up sound information and transfer it into electrical impulses to uh, send that information up through the brainstem into the auditory cortex. And so what we think is happening typically with uh, ototoxicity is that because the cochlea is an organ, it receives blood supply just like every other organ in the body. And once the drugs get into the cochlea, they bathe in the sensory cells, which uh, may eventually destroy those sensory cells. And in some cases may also affect the nerve that is above the cochlea, uh, sending the signal up to the brain. And so we think that th the main mechanism is the dying essentially of those uh, inner ear hair cells. And so a lot of time pe people will ask, how do you test for ototoxicity? And the most uh, common reason is because no one really understands why and how we can get a baby or a toddler to actually respond during a hearing test. And so we have different techniques for testing all ages. And in the next slide, uh, which I'm not gonna go to in detail, uh, given the interest of time, there we talk a little bit about um, a number of what we call physiologic tests where a person can sit and we can test their hearing passively. So I just put a little um, probe in the ear and I record uh, sounds coming out of the ear uh, with a microphone and uh, playing sound with the microphone and there's two receivers and then you can record the hearing response um, in that way without the person responding. And this little baby to the left here, uh, you can see they have wires attached to their head and then also little inserts where we place sounds into the ear. This is called an auditory brainstem response. So one way to collect information passively is recording um, brainstem electrical potentials to sound. And this is essentially how we test all babies. 
Once the, uh, the infants get older, we can train them when they hear a sound to put a toy in a bucket or play some type of an engaging game um, to where they will actually respond that it's fun and you can keep their attention a bit longer. And that can usually start about uh, two and a half years, but right before then, if the, in, if the child is a bit too young not to quite capture the drop in the bucket toy game, we'll actually train them to look at uh, light up videos when the sound is playing. So we're conditioning them to respond to that sound. And so the goal really is that, you know, we have different age appropriate techniques to test um, babies up to adults, and we can test at different pitches which can, which can capture, um, you know, things like ototoxicity at a very early age. And so one way that we actually record our hearing test results is through an audiogram. And an audiogram, if you look to this figure on the left, on the right, excuse me, is um, it has a dB or essentially volume on the Y axis, so vertically. And then on the X, I think of that, I always tell people to imagine a piano. And so um, the X axis represents pitches or frequencies. And so to the very left, you have the lowest pitch at 125 up to the highest at 8,000. And the further down on the graph that you see is uh, like a different uh, symbol. So for example, the look of the uh, furthest down, you'll see a lawnmower or a rocket and so forth. That means that the sound had to be extremely loud in order to hear that pitch. And so this is where we record our um, responses or thresholds to sound uh, using our behavioral tests. And the yellow banana in the middle here is what we call our speech banana. So that's our critical pitch region for uh, processing speech in the human ear. There's different ways to actually capture when ototoxicity occurs. One is to respond by testing higher pitch sounds and, and indicating the lowest volume the person can hear on this graph. Others are using grading scales to indicate um, you know, whether or not that person actually notices dysfunction with their hearing in different listening conditions. And so um, those are, there are common grading skills that we use regularly for that called the CTCA E5, uh, B5 and others. Um, and so real quick, the, the clinical presentation of ototoxicity um, is that sometimes you might get ringing in your ears or tinnitus. And uh, most commonly individuals will develop hearing loss, which is a, called sensory neural hearing loss that is permanent. And it tends to occur in the frequencies greater than um, eight kilohertz. So eight kilohertz, if, if you think back to that um, audiogram that I just showed, it sounds kind of like uh, S's and Z's. They're higher pitch consonants. Um, and uh, we know that if we test out to 16 kilohertz, we'll tend to see the, the effects of these medications early. And over time, it could progress to lower frequencies. So this could be in one ear, unilateral, or in both. Um, and we also, uh, some new evidence by uh, Lisa Hunter's group, uh, Chelsea Blankenship published a paper to show that it's not just what you record on the audiogram, it's also functionally because there are some neural deficits. Individuals may exhibit difficulties listening and noise. So trying to pick out speech and noise, even though their hearing may um, on the audiogram look normal. And so, um, and also as Amit said uh, earlier, there are vestibular balance issues associated with the ear, which we're not gonna discuss today. So these are really the four types of major ototoxicity symptoms we look out for and we try to monitor in the audiology clinic. Um, uh, really quick and briefly, you'll notice if you look at the literature, there's a lot of variability in what the incidence and prevalence of ototoxicity is, uh, particularly in patients with cystic fibrosis. And um, a big portion of this is limited to the metrics that we use. So before that we really knew um, ototoxicity could affect really high pitches, uh, audiology typically only tests out to a range of about eight kilohertz. And at that point, when you see hearing loss, it's already functionally affecting your everyday listening because it's affecting your consonants and speech. And so now um, with these new metrics uh, for physiologic and behavioral testing, we can go to a much higher frequency level and detect it before it gets to those speech frequencies. So an example of these differences are, for example, Chang and Al-Malki are showing a reported incidence of 14% in the Chang study, which was done in 2009 versus Al-Malki's in 2015. And, and part of that difference is really the metrics they're using. So the moral of the story is the higher the pitch you can test, um, the more sensitive the test is to detecting ototoxicity. And when we use those tests, we see uh, reports of hearing loss up to 57%, which we're showing in some of our newer studies.
Next slide. So variability in um, developing ototoxicity can be due to differences in clinical patient characteristics, study method, uh, methodology, concomitant treatments, as you see in this slide. Um, and as I indicated earlier, there's a number of risk factors such as age and noise that can also increase your risk. So it's not that we can pick out a person in clinic and automatically identify what's gonna cause their hearing loss. We have to consider all of these factors. Next slide. Um, and finally, this is a paper that we published in 2017 in the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis. Um, this may look remotely familiar. It's similar to, it is an audiogram, but there's four separate audiograms uh, separated into quadrants. So the upper left is showing a group of individuals at OHSU with cystic fibrosis who received aminoglycoside treatments over their lifetime and actually uh, maintained normal hearing. So again, we tested a higher pitch range. So uh, low to the left pitch, all the way to the right is higher pitch. And um, everything above the red line is what we consider for uh, normal hearing. So our, our cutoff is 25 dB. Um, and so this number of ears, which is 35, we call these our golden ears. So they've had all of these you know, treatments with aminoglycosides such as amicase and tobramycin, but these individuals never lose hearing. We don't know why. To the right now, you're seeing individuals who have normal hearing um, in those pitches important for speech processing, but you see the lines start to drop below the red in the higher pitches. So those individuals, if they just went in for a standard audiology test, it would look like their hearing was normal. But when we tested a much higher pitch range, they are showing some uh, deficit. To the bottom left, you have a few people that have what we call notches. So a couple of ears where they just show hearing loss at one pitch. And to the right, which is the most concerning group, we consider these the, uh, the higher risk individuals where they've had treatment and they lose hearing across all frequency regions. So you can see most of the lines are below the red. Um, so this is really important. It's also important to consider their cumulative lifelong dose exposure to aminoglycosides to be able to determine who's at higher risk for this. Next slide. And so this is an example of an individual who we treated in the clinic, 26 years old, has had a bilateral lung transplant and a host of other um, severe health issues. She, uh, at the time, had normal hearing when she started our study. This is an example of a hearing exam in the middle of one of our research studies where her hearing was relatively normal to the left in the low pitches, and you can see this big dip. Um, she's starting to lose hearing in the higher pitches. So um, in this example, she had a severe hearing loss uh, from 4,000 to 8,000 Hertz. Again, that frequency region important for uh, speech and consonants. And then after a two week course of IV amicacin, her hearing went to the profound level. So the further down on the graph, the more hearing loss. This individual uh, was identified in one of our studies and um, was set up for cochlear implant therapy. Um, and it's interesting because she's 26 and has had a number of IV aminoglycosides in the past. And for some reason, after this one um, course, she, she lost hearing in both ears. So we're, we're trying to figure out why. Next slide. And finally, um, some individuals will ask, well, why, you know, why isn't monitoring happening regularly in uh, CF centers? And there's a lot of reasons for this. And one of the most important is that patients are already seeing a number of clinical providers, um, which is really critical for their overall health and care. And audiology is not commonly in that CF care team day. Um, the other portion is that there's a lot of barriers in the clinics themselves because audiology is primarily um, sees individuals in the outpatient clinic um, on a referral basis. So there's a lot of uh, things we can do to implement an ototoxicity monitoring program without requiring an audiologist to be part of the team, although that's ideal. Next slide. And we can move on from this slide, actually. We've kind of gone over the details, so. Um, there are a number of guidelines for monitoring, and um, these are professional guidelines in audiology, but there are no guidelines in the cystic fibrosis community yet that are specific to CF, although I, I did hear that some may be coming out soon. Um, so it's important to know that we need to get these into other communities that uh, prescribe these medications um, rather than just focusing on having guidelines in audiology. So we're moving to uh, different groups that are helping to support uh, 
uh, protocols for recommendations to do this ototoxicity management in specialty clinics. We can move through that. Um, and essentially the, this slide is a, basically indicating that the research that's been done so far uh, says that most CF clinics don't monitor hearing. Um, and again, there's barriers related to this with I think the model of how audiology is run and the fact that audiologists are not typically part of this, uh, these specialty clinical teams. And so individuals like me and Amit and others, I work with Dr. Ronald Rubenstein, we have a you know, we do have a specific interest and passion about improving ototoxicity management, especially with the more we learn in these studies. So the goal is to increase um, how we can provide a more efficient way of monitoring hearing without, you know, uh, putting too many demands on the clinic themselves and uh, on the patients. And finally, I'd like to end with this. There's a new international ototoxicity monitoring group. Um, we have a number of professionals, clinicians, students, and uh, audiologists, researchers from around the world that are part of this group. And our main goal is really to help uh, with ototoxicity management um, and to move this forward in clinical specialties. And so uh, one of the publications that we just had, and I have it under review, but it was actually just accepted in the American Journal of Audiology is specific to protocol recommendations for CF. Um, so that should be in PubMed soon, and uh, we should have that in print by the end of the summer. And back to Amit. I think there's a delay when I advance, so I apologize, although I'm hopefully advancing on time, but this is a, um, it's, it's, Michael is a, a person with CF who uh, Angie works with, and I'm not sure if you're seeing the slide or not, but he is an audiologist himself, and you know he wishes, um, uh, we had presented with him before, but he wishes there is more hearing screening, more counseling regarding to ototoxicity and hearing loss, and that there was questionnaires that we had implemented in clinic um, on a regular basis, and um, there he is. Um, and, uh, but what I wanted to just say is that there's so many things, um, we've had these algorithms in place, the pandemic, um, you know, just uh, coordination can sometimes get in the way, um, but, you know, we're gonna hopefully update this according to the um, recommendations that uh, uh, with the consortium that Angie chairs that she just talked about, but essentially starting at age four, uh, we screen our uh, patients and if they're abnormal, uh, they have yearly audiograms and monitoring if they're normal, and no exposure, we repeat that every four years. If there is an exposure, we get an audiogram in six months, and then yearly if there's chronic exposure that occurs. And as you can see in the box here on the left, um, and, uh, and I just wanna show that we have the same uh, algorithm, similar algorithm for those over age 18, but on the left, we include what an exposure is, and we will be, um, if glycopeptides or vancomycin is actually part of that, um, but not necessarily included here. Slide. Um, so essentially, what I want to just briefly talk about is, um, you know, that in addition to screening, um, we talk about prevention being really important, including counseling our patients on hazards of unsafe listening habits, especially when uh, we had published data that we're not sharing here on how, um, you know, uh, people with CF view uh, uh, noise as a, and like their listening habits as, a, um, as something that adds to that complexity, as Angie mentioned, uh, there can be additional and synergistic uh, you know, hearing loss that can be uh, associated with that. But also years ago, um, I want to touch on the fact that tobramycin used to be dosed three times a day. And um, based on um, uh, new efficacy and safety data published by Alan Smith and others, um, you know, we showed that there was improvement in kidney injury um, and uh, you know, with once daily dosing. They did testing, limited testing for hearing loss, although that um, data is unclear given how um, limited the, uh, the study was. But essentially, our monitoring at that time was involved, uh, you know, it, monitoring has been and still is in many in, you know, institutions, checking peaks and troughs 30 minutes after the end of a 30-minute infusion, um, though there's lots of errors that I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, as we monitor based on that. And though uh, we had parameters for safe area under the curve, um, an area of the curve essentially is a measure of total systemic exposure to a drug, um, you can't actually calculate that based on uh, the type of monitoring uh, that was suggested here. So essentially, um, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, 
uh, we realized that troughs don't necessarily correlate with safe AUC measures that we talked about. And we needed to come up with a different methodology. Um, and it was also you know, challenging to get accurate peak levels, which is crucial to effective treatment and, and minimizing the toxicity. And here the graphic shows on the, on the right, the, uh, you know, the comparison between the reported peak from our older methodology, comparing it to um, how we're you know, trying to calculate the, calculate the peak, um, which as you can see is very often higher. And instead of a peak and trough, um, we feel that you, know, you can uh, measure two measurable levels of a post-drug infusion to calculate the AOC. And this is essentially how we calculate the, the peak, but also how we're gonna be calculating uh, the area under the curve. So in this next slide, um, what we did was we did a quality improvement study um, uh, looking at that. And so what we did identify was that um, we actually had 60% of our patients um, have super therapeutic doses. On the left here, um, you know, we looked at 27 patients, as you can see, therapeutic levels using reported peak um, was, uh, you know, in 82% of our patients. Um, calculated peak, you know, showed that dropped to 274. But if we looked at AUC, the actual gold standard of looking at that, we saw that the 60% were over. And on the table to the right, um, we saw that 16 of the 27 patients who were sub, sub, super therapeutic actually seen here. And I just wanted to highlight two patients. So only two patients would have been identified as being on super therapeutic uh, level, um, you know, dosing um, using our old methodology. So since we switched to the AUC monitoring, now we feel confident that we're not um, overdosing these patients. And many of these patients, um, as you can see, were, were not caught. Um, and now we know that you know 50% of centers out there still use this old methodology, um, and that may have changed since the last time I checked. But it's important to make sure that we're doing um, doing that that, um, that appropriate care. Um, so before I hand uh, the presentation back to Angie, I just want to talk about a yet unpublished uh, study that we performed um, with our sponsor, um, uh, Decibel Therapeutics, uh, here in Boston. Um, it was a study looking at the use of point of care device uh, devices, and as you know. When someone is scheduled for audiometry, um, you know, and usually that is scheduled for the future at an outside location, or even if it's the same day, the sound booth is across the street. A lot can happen between that time, leading to someone beginning to get the study. You turn left, you get some coffee, you get a phone call. Next thing you know, you're in the car and you forgot to go to your, um, your the, you get your audiometry. So we used point of care technology and recruited 72 people using the career automated hearing test and using the state-of-the-art headphones that we're always afraid we're gonna lose, they're about $100,000. Um, as you can see, they're very stylish. Um, and we use a tablet to uh, measure a broad range of testing, which uh, Angie will also just touch on in a moment. But essentially, we first looked at a cross-section of people at our center and saw that there was a 41% evidence of hearing loss, which goes with the data that Angie uh, recently shared. And then as you can see, our traditional um, testing um, you know, which goes up to eight kilohertz. In this point of care device, we were able to go to 16 kilohertz. Um, and this is, uh, you know, something that, you know, that's why we, we see this higher prevalence. And we also looked at a subgroup of patients who were essentially um, being serially monitored while they were on IV antibiotics. And we looked at both aminoglycosides and glycopeptides like vancomycin. And as you can see from the top table, um, we actually didn't see any uh, patients um, have, uh, you know, evidence of uh, toxicity with serial immunoglycoside dosing. And we think this is related to the fact that we've now been checking AUCs for so long that we probably are avoiding hearing loss. And so, you know, just I think exemplifies though the numbers are really low, just how important that uh, monitoring is. And, but as you can see here with vancomycin, we saw increased, um, you know, uh, hearing loss um, uh, thresholds being achieved. And essentially, um, now we've switched to also checking AUCs for vancomycin, um, and, uh, and, and that way we're hopefully avoiding that as well. We saw the same problems with vancomycin that we saw with, um, with probamycin. And there's also so much more to learn. This study is very small, and so we need a larger study, but we also saw hearing loss in uh, using other antibiotics. That's what it's uh, that no IVs, essentially no IV phototoxic medications, and I'll fix that. Um, but essentially, we didn't see um, much with that group. Yeah, thanks, Amit. And so one other uh, thing I wanted to stress really quick towards the end of this talk uh, is so Amit was talking a bit, we know that the intravenous treatments can uh, be a little bit more toxic because you're getting a larger dose. However, most patients are on inhaled treatments and we don't have a lot of information about how the inhaled may cause hearing loss. And so 
when we talk about monitoring, again, I'm, I'm, I stress everybody should be monitored because most are uninhaled, even if they haven't had an IV amitase center uh, Toby before. So um, one of the approaches we have, and this is in the paper in the American Journal of Audiology paper that we just published from the IOMG group, one of the approaches we have is point of care and bedside testing as Amit described. So there's ways to make this more efficient to take the demands off of the clinic. So for hearing screening, we could use a tablet while the patient is in the hospital at their bedside and have them actually test themselves. So an example is the upper right, where you see the patient that has headphones and they're holding and they're going through all the instructions of the hearing test. And there have been validated measures to show that some of these tests are, as long as the, low, the level of the noise is low, they're not um, far off compared to what we would get in actual soundproof booth. Also, um, other tests, there are physiologic tests like otoacoustic emissions, and there's surveys that we could use to try to detect if there's ringing in the ears, tinnitus, um, and there's bedside tests for balance. So I, again, I would encourage to look back at this paper when it's out. Um, so we're providing some examples of how to, to do management in a way that's efficient, and again, um, that can kind of detect each of these ototoxicity symptoms. The next and final slide talks about management of ototoxicity. And as we know, even in audiology, if ototoxicity wasn't an issue, an individual that has hearing loss may go into a clinic and uh, look for amplification. And so um, whether the cause is age-related hearing loss, ototoxicity, noise, or so forth, when you lose your hearing and it's permanent, um, amplification is our best option. So we do, uh, we can use hearing aids or the cochlear implant surgical devices there if the hearing is severe enough. And, um, you know, if, if there are concerns about balance or tinnitus, there's ways to do therapeutic approaches for that to also improve. So I would suggest talking to your physician if you have concerns and also um, talking to your local audiology clinic. And finally, I think Amit's gonna just briefly uh, mention a couple of clinical trials there for ototherapeutics. Um, I think you're talking about these, but um, I don't know if you want to touch on them, but. I, I, either way, I'm, I, I'm happy to. So <laughs> we're, we're right at the end. So there are, uh, what's really interesting now is there's a number of companies that have developed otother uh, ototherapeutic treatments and they're in their uh, phase two clinical trials. So typically these are uh, medications or a pill you may take while you're on an ototoxic drug like uh, tobramycin. And the goal of these is to prevent hearing loss during the treatment. And so there's two main companies, Auricula Therapeutics and Sound Pharmaceuticals, that is working towards um, moving their ototherapeutic through the FDA. And at some point, it would be great because then we wouldn't have to worry about ototoxicity if we could find the right treatment. So, so we just wanted to, you know, thank the people. Um, and, and Jenna, if you want to, you know, thank the group that you work with, incredible group of people, and you are, you know, the the person to go to, um, you know, with all of this stuff. And I'd like to also thank the people that I've worked with, um, including those from Decibel Pharmaceuticals. Um, there is so much to go through. We took a, our presentation previously from what was almost an hour and 45 minutes to 45 minutes. So <laughs> hopefully we were able to successfully get through it all and we'll hopefully be answering all your questions here and later. Yeah, and I just wanted to stress, I also wanted to thank Amit and uh, CFRI again. This is, it's wonderful for us to be part of this community and be able to share the knowledge that we have from our projects. And feel free to contact me personally, and I'm sure Amit would feel the same. If you have any specific questions, we can provide our email or information to, to Siri to share. Uh, this last picture, this is the Marion Downs in that photo, and, and she developed a newborn hearing screening program. And so you can see we've come quite a, a long way um, for hearing monitoring compared to what they used to do back in the 60s. Thank you so much for such an incredible presentation. And of course, if people are looking at the time, they're gonna realize that we have um, the next presentation in two minutes. So the things I wanna say, we have a lot of questions. The chat has been um, very active and it, this is such a critical issue in our community, a quality of life issue. And we're so grateful to the two of you for raising awareness. And now I just wanna get very, very active in this. I can say my own daughter has never had a hearing test. Uh, who, she's 26 and has CF. I think it was when she was in, at the pediatricians years ago. So we have many questions, surgery, testing, um, whether there's stem cell research. So I promise everyone two things. 
if you go to our YouTube channel, we actually have two podcasts that we did earlier with Dr. Grannis and Dr. Euler about um, odor toxicity. Also, they have kindly offered to share, at least uh, Angela has, <laughs> Angie has to share her email address. And then we will post questions to all these questions. All the questions you have, we'll post answers. So you will receive them. Um, so I do apologize to everyone that we are out of time. I encourage you to meet us at the next presentation. Um, I think the, the last thing I wanna ask is, can patients say to their care providers and their CF team, please test my hearing? Is that appropriate for people that- to... Absolutely, absolutely. Because I think most people don't know to ask and it's clearly such a huge issue for our community. And I, I think people need to hear that they can advocate for themselves uh, to insist that their hearing is tested. Yeah, and I would say I, I'm an audiologist and, and Amit's a physician. So for me, it's so impactful to have a physician say that it's important to ask. And so if your ears are ringing, if you're having balance issues or any concerns about your hearing, ask for a referral. And we may forget to ask, and that's why it's important. We have checklists that we get to give patients who you know, want to make sure that you know, what are the goals of your visit and hearing is right there. Um, so it's just important to ask because uh, you know, it's... It's something that we need to do a better job of making sure we're screening even at our center. I think a lot of hearing tests are gonna be conducted over the next few months, <laughs> thanks to your presentation. So thank you both so much for sharing your time, your expertise. Thank you everybody for being here and we'll see you at the next presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Angie. Thanks, Amit.